All right, so the, the messages that I'm going to be talking about today is the role of death in salvation and the plan of salvation. And what I mean by plan is that God is a God of order. He's a God of um, discipline. He's a God of order. He doesn't do anything haphazardly, does he? Does he uh, just kind of fly by the seat of his pants, you know? That's, uh, you know, excuse me for that expression. No, he sees everything. He sees the end from the beginning. And he is a God of order. And so salvation or the salvation of humanity, there was a, a plan. And so that's what I mean by plan. And so we're going to be talking about the role of death in that plan of salvation and how it relates to the big picture and how it relates to us personally. Now, last week I was at a funeral. I was at a funeral and it's not every day that, that I'm faced with, with death. In fact, the last funeral that I went to was over 10 years ago. It was my, uh, my grandfather and that was an interesting experience. But, you know, you think about people in today's society, doctors, nurses, uh, police, morgues, morticians, uh, even crime scene investigators. You know, they come face to face with death every day. And for me, when I was at the funeral, it was a chance to really reflect. And as I, I, I looked at this individual, now, fortunately, they had lived a very long life. That's not always the case in every funeral, but they had lived a very long and prosperous life and they believed in the Lord. And uh, I believe that uh, they're going to be in heaven, which is always a blessing to go to a funeral like that. But as I sat there and, and I didn't sit there, but I, but I stood there and, and, I, and I looked at the, the lady that had died and just the, the lifeless form, it gives you a, a chance to reflect on life and a chance to reflect on death. And it makes you think about, at least it makes me think about three things concerning death. The inevitability of death, the universality of death, and the spontaneity of death. It will happen, it happens to everybody, and it can happen at any time. Isn't that true? Those are absolute truths, right? And we all know these things. I mean, everybody that is born into this world and is alive today knows those things to be true because they've seen it, they've experienced it. Absolutely true. And yet in the face of these truths, there is so much confusion about what death actually is. Isn't that right? Isn't there confusion about what happens when you die? No, there's a lot of confusion. Now, the majority of the world is confused about it. Now, some people will say, well, when you, have, when you die, uh, you essentially, that person dies, they become worms, food for worms, right? Become food for worms. But the majority of people in our world today, religious people, whatever religion you're, you're a part of, and even some people that really don't follow any kind of organized or institutionalized religion, still believe in an afterlife. Life after death. Isn't, isn't that most people believe in some sort of life after death? And the variation, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, but the variation of what people believe, it, it goes a little bit of something like this. That when you die, only a part of you dies. But there's a part of you that lives on in the afterlife. Isn't that what most people believe? That's what most Christians believe. But what does the Bible actually say? What does the Bible say about death? And how does that understanding shape, how does our understanding of death shape our understanding of the gospel and of salvation? And I want to just say this before we get into our study. If you don't understand death, you can't understand fully the plan of salvation. The whole plan, the big picture. And so we're going to get into that in these next two presentations. Because they're, they're two subjects that I believe are intricately tied together. So the first verse I want to look at real quickly. Now we're not going to get into a big long study on what death actually is. 
Uh, but we are going to hit a couple of those. And, and our brother here mentioned the first one. What was that? The death will not anything. That's in. Does anybody know where that one is at? Ecclesiastes 9.5. Ecclesiastes. So you have your Bibles. Turn with me. Ecclesiastes 9.5 For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know how much? Nothing. The dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Well, that kind of blows out of the water what most people or what most Christians believe. Because if you believe that part of you dies, but yet part of you is still alive, and the, the part of you that is still alive is your consciousness that your consciousness somehow survives and well this clearly refutes that ideology that if you're if you die you know you do not know anything you're not conscious at all now turn with me to Psalm chapter 13 Psalm chapter 13 and verse 3 Psalm chapter 13 verse 3 consider and hear me O Lord my God lighten my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now, some of you are familiar with those two verses, because you've heard them before. Now, the Bible equates, and this isn't the only time, but it's done many times in the Bible. I don't remember the exact number, I think 50-something times, that death is referred to as a sleep, as a sleep. And Jesus also confirms this same concept in John chapter 11. And I want to spend a little bit more time here in John chapter 11. Now we're going to be looking at a multitude of verses. So um, I hope your fingers are nimble this morning. John chapter 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named who? Lazarus. Now Lazarus was one of Jesus' closest friends, wasn't it? Lazarus was sick. Now skip down to verse 11. These things saith unto he, and after that he saith unto them. Now he's speaking, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Our friend Lazarus does what? Sleeps, sleepeth. But I go that I may awaken him out of, out of sleep. Then the disciples... So then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. And he said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And so here, Jesus is referring to the death of Lazarus as a, as a sleep. He's referring to as as asleep. Now when Jesus, that's what he, the conversation that he had with his disciples. Now when he gets to Lazarus' house, he meets Martha. Look in verse 23. Notice what he says. And by the way, if, if you're asleep, and I think this is an important uh, uh, distinction to make, if you're asleep, what do you expect to happen? You're going to wake up. It's asleep because you're going to wake up. And so I believe, and I, I think the, the, the context bear this out, and we'll, we'll uh, get along with this further, that this, this death that is spoken of, this death that happens to each one of us, it's a sleep, some call it the, it's the first death, right? It's a sleep or referred to as a sleep because something is going to happen. That all are going to wake from it. There's going to be something that happens. Now look at verse 23. Now Martha knew what would happen. And she says when it's going to happen. Verse 23, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. He'll do what? He'll rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the 
resurrection at the last day. And so Jesus, he taught Lazarus, Mary, Martha, his disciples. Where did they get this idea of a resurrection? They got it from Jesus Christ. She said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And that's one thing that has always kind of confused me is that if a person dies and yet they don't really die, they go to heaven or, God forbid, hell, which, by the way, you never go to a funeral and they say he's looking up you know, at us right now. They're always looking down, right? Because <laughs> that's comforting to people. It's comforting. We want to be comforted that our loved one is in a better place. And so this is uh, why people say that. But Martha says, I know that he will rise at the last day in the resurrection. And so there's going to be a, a, a resurrection. Now, if, if a person dies but yet doesn't really die then why would you need a resurrection and I've spoken to my own father and mother about this and I asked them a question well if a person goes to heaven after they die and then they apparently come back with Jesus at the second coming to get those that are still on the earth but yet it says that the dead in Christ are going to rise and then their two bodies are going to meet. It's like, well, why doesn't God just make them a body up in heaven? Why does he have to like bring them back down here to earth to make it out of the dust and then connect it together? And it's like, you know, so there's a lot of that confusion that takes place. Now look at John chapter 11, verse 25. And Jesus said unto her, now this is his response when she says, I know he's going to rise at the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Amen? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Shall never, never die. Believest thou this. Do you believe that? Amen. That he is the resurrection and the life? That if we believe in Jesus Christ, we will, we will never die. Yet Christians die every day. This lady that I was at their, her, her funeral, she died. She was a Christian. So what death is it that Christians shall never die from. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. And I've tried to get answers from different individuals about this term that is used only in the book of Revelation. We're going to look at it now. Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now this is also mentioned in two other places. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 and Revelation 21 8. And I'll read them real quick. Revelation 20 verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. So the first resurrection on such the second death has no power. This is off. I'm sorry? The, the camera is off, but it's not. Yeah, it's, it's on. It's facing me. Yeah, it's facing me. Right. Thanks for looking out, though, brother. <laughs> All right, so Revelation 21, verse 8. That's what brothers and sisters are for, right? To look out for each other. I appreciate that, brother. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, uh, lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so the Bible speaks of a second, 
second death. Now, as far as I tried to ascertain, what is it that most of Christianity believes this second death is? And would you know, and if you ever want to test this, this out, if you have any Christian friends or happen to run into a, uh, a person at Walmart and, you know, you get in a conversation, find out they're a Christian, probably doesn't happen as much up here as it, down, it does down in the South, <laughs> where I'm from. Everybody's... Everybody's church people down there. When I moved down there, I met my neighbor, and they said, y'all church people? I said, yes, I am. In fact, I, uh, you know, I do full-time ministry. They're like, oh, yes. <laughs> All right, I won't tell you exactly what I believe yet, but, <laughs> you know, we can agree where we can. But anyways, ask them, you know, what is the second death? And the common answer, at least the one that I found, was that the second death is is when the people, the wicked, they go to hell, a place called hell, and they're tortured forever and ever and ever. That's the second death. So, let's think about that idea. So torture is a second death. Now, I've never been tortured, thank God. But um, I'm sure you've seen probably movies or TVs or heard stories about people being tortured. But you can imagine if you are being tortured, just let's say for a couple hours, someone is torturing you physically and you are in immense and extreme pain. If you're being tortured, what is it that you would desire? Death. You would rather have death. Now, why would you desire that? Because you, do, you would desire death because you would no longer be tortured. So how is it that torture could be the same thing as, as death? Does it make any sense? No, to me, I, I just don't see it m making any logical sense. And so you can ask that questions and, uh, you know, they'll, that's probably the, the answer that you will get, that it refers to... Um, uh, eternal torment. Now, this obviously has to do with an understanding of the immortality of the soul. And you may ask, is the soul not immortal? So turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And now we're just kind of setting the foundation and then we're going to get into more a, a little bit more practical stuff and how this relates to salvation, the plan of salvation, and how it relates to us personally. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 15 and 16. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, the person being referenced here, the one that is dwelling in the light that no man can approach to, is the Father. Now we come to the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. But the point is that God and Christ have immortality. There's a difference between innate or inherent immortality, something that someone possesses by nature, you possess it by nature, versus derived immortality, something that is given or something that is dependent. Now, we can have eternal life, amen? Amen? I thought this was a, this was a church service. I thought this was a group of Christian people here. We can have eternal life, right? You don't sound very excited about it. <laughs> you should be excited about it, right? I mean, we should be jumping up and down. We can have eternal life. We don't have to fear death. But that eternal life is dependent. It's not innate or inherent in us. Our life or our eternal life is dependent on our connection to God. Is that true? Amen. Right? Now, going back to death, the Bible speaks 
of two deaths, a first and a second death. Now, the Bible doesn't actually say first death, but it does say second death, that there is a second death. Now, the idea of a first death is predicated on the fact that there is a second one, right? If there's a second one, then there must be one that precedes it, uh, a first death. Now, what is the difference? The first death is asleep. The second death is not. The first death is asleep because you wake up from it. The second death, there will be no awakening. And what I mean by awakening, Jesus, when he went to Lazarus, or he was going to go to Lazarus, he says, I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So asleep is something that you'll be wakened out of. The second death, there will be no resurrection from. There will be no recovering from that one. There will be no resurrection from that. Well, does that make sense so far? Yes. Right. So we see that there's a first death, that there's a second death, and then there is a resurrection. Now, how many people are going to be resurrected? Turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. How many people are going to be resurrected? John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves... How many? All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Okay, so there's the resurrection. So everybody that has gone in the grave, that has died, will be resurrected. Will be resurrected. But here Jesus says, there's not just one resurrection. He says that there's two. Look at verse 29. Unto the resurrection that all have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation. And so all everyone will come forth from the grave. But there's two separate resurrections. A resurrection of life and a resurrection of condemnation. So we'd see two deaths, two resurrections. Now, when is the resurrection of life? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When is the resurrection of life? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. It says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And what will happen? And the dead in Christ shall rise. Okay, so there is a resurrection. There's the resurrection of life. Well, how do I know it's going to be the resurrection of life? What does it say in verse 17? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so this is the resurrection of life because they're raised up and then they will ever be with the Lord. So there's not going to be a second death for them. They are raised to life and they will have that life throughout eternity. When does that take place? At sec the second coming. And furthermore, the dead in Christ will be, shall ever be with the Lord after he comes, then it kind of does away with the idea that they're ever with the Lord before that. All right? All right, now, they will know, once they are resurrected, they will not see uh, they will not see death. And we read that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. I'll read it again. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, that the second death has no power. Second death has no power. Now upon whom does the second death have power or apply? Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 and 8. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So, if we inherit, who is it that inherits? 
An inheritance is talking about a relationship between a father and a son, right? Isn't that how it works? That you pass down your inheritance to an offspring. And so we inherit because we're, we're sons. But what do sons do? Sons overcome. Isn't that what it says? He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now verse 8, But the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire, and the brimstone, which is the second death. Kind of a sobering verse there. Fearful, unbelieving, abominable murders, idolaters, list all these things. These are those that the second death is going to have power over them. I think this verse is very clear that if we don't overcome these things, that is our destination and we'll experience the second death. Now all die in the first death, right? Everybody dies. It's just a part of life. But why is it that all men die? Why do we die the first death? Why do we die the first death? Some people just accept it as a fact of life. Wages of sin is death. Yes, right. The wages of sin is death. But my question is, and I, and I, I believe that, and most people, you know, which I think is a good application, will apply that to the second death. Right? Yeah. R- right, correct. Yeah, right. Um, but at the same time, we do experience death. Like when we die the first death, we, in a sense, we cease to exist, right? We cease to exist. We don't have any consciousness. Now we're sleeping because he resurrects us, but we're still dead. The only fact that it's asleep is, I believe, because he resurrects us. But my question is, like, for example, we know that babies are mortal. We see, uh, hear about abortions all the time. We hear tragic stories of little children, babies dying. Why do they die? And, and is it connected to sin? Well, is it connected to their sin? Do you die the first death because of your sins? No. So whose sin brings about the first death? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Whose death or whose sin is responsible for the first death or the death of all mankind? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now who slept? Who slept? When it says he comes the first fruits of them that slept. What does it mean? Died. All who died. Right? All who die. He's the first fruits of all who die. Because the resurrection, all resurrections that have ever happened, ever will happen, are based on the fact that Christ was resurrected. Amen. Right? I mean, if Christ was not resurrected, then there will be no resurrection. In fact, that's what Paul says. He argues that point. That all resurrections are based upon the resurrection of Christ. The wicked and the righteous, all resurrections. Now, verse 21, For since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So man brought about death. Man brought about a resurrection. Who is the man that brought about death? Adam. Who is the man that brought about the resurrection of life? Jesus Christ. In fact, he says this, verse 22, For as in Adam, how many die? 
all. What death? The first death. I don't believe that applies to the second death. We don't die the second death because of Adam's sin, right? Correct. Yeah, correct. But there is confusion on that topic, isn't there? Isn't there some confusion on that topic? I do believe so. Without the understanding of death, and here's, here's what, without a right understanding of death, that Adam's sin, as it says in, 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 in right here in verse 21, in Adam all die, all die the first death. You see, people want to attribute the result and the sin of Adam as applying to the second death. Because see, if you don't make any distinction between the first and the second death, because you don't really die, there's not really a death, people confuse and say, well, we're automatically condemned to eternal punishment because of Adam's sin. Are you with me? Now, and if you, if you believe that, and then if you believe that, uh, let's say, a person's choice does not necessarily have anything to do with the efficacy of baptism, that if you baptize a baby and that baptism is completely valid, no matter the choice or what that baby knows, then you would simply baptize babies for Adam's sin. Do you see the connection there? But most people fail to, to make the distinction that Adam's sin took us to the first grave, or the first death. That's the extent of which it takes place. But see, Christ, in his life and his resurrection, negates everything that we receive from Adam. And hopefully this becomes a little bit clearer. So verse 21, in Adam all die, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So he contrasts the two Adams, Adam and Christ. And that Adam brought about death, Christ brings about life. life. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 5 and verse 18. This is probably one of the most, uh, uh, could be one of the most uh, controversial chapters in the New Testament. Isn't that right? <laughs> you know, a lot of debate going on about this. A uh, series of verses here. But let's look at verse 18 in that understanding. Um, verse, actually, let's start in verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, by, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all to condemnation. Okay, now we just talked about what that judgment, what that condemnation was. What is it? The first death. In Adam all die. Even so, continuing on, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now people read that one in many different ways. And the way that I understand it, and obviously, you know, I, I believe this is a correct understanding, but I'm open to hearing other points of view, is that Adam brought the condemnation of the first death. He plunged man and mankind into sin and into death. But Christ, by his life and his victory, he negated everything that we receive from Adam. And the free gift, how do you explain what is this free gift? I believe the free gift is a second life by the resurrection. But that free gift comes upon how many? All men. Unto justification of life. So it comes upon all men. Doesn't it say that the free gift comes upon all men? I believe that's, that's referring to the resurrection that Christ, he, in, in his life and his death and his resurrection, was able to justify 
the resurrecting of every single man. And so then after he has given them a second life, after the resurrection, then each man can stand for their own sins and for what they have done. And that Adam's sin or whatever they received from their parents, whatever they received from Adam, is not held accountable or responsible. I don't know if that makes sense to you at all. I hope that is clear enough. But... Hopefully it'll, it'll become clear as we go on. Now, no one chooses to die the first death. Is that right? Do you choose to die? I mean, besides, except, you know, suicides, right? No right? If you wanted to chose between death or life, which one would you choose? Because everybody wants to live forever. Everybody wants to live. Nobody wants to die, you know, with the exception of those that are, have a miserable, you know, terrible life that are experiencing some, some serious issues that want to take their own life. But even then, um, nobody chooses to die. It's just a fact of life. Now, how many cho- will choose to be resurrected? Everybody. Nobody will choose to be resurrected. It's just a fact that will occur. So you see how that works. Nobody chose to die because of Adam's sin, the first death. Nobody will choose to be resurrected because of what Christ did. You see how that works. But, what we can choose, what can we choose? Which resurrection? So we can't choose whether or not we'll be resurrected, but we can choose which resurrection. And what resurrection do you want to be in? The first one, because in the first one, the second death has no power. So, there's a first life, a first death, a second life by the resurrection, a first resurrection, a second resurrection, and a second death. Now, what, do you happen, what happens to you after the resurrection is determined upon what happens in this life. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you shall never, never die. You shall never, never die. Speaking of, you will never die in the second, second death. You will never die in the second death. Now, how is it that we take part in the first resurrection? How do we avoid that second death? Again. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. But those weren't the exa- those weren't the words <laughs> that uh, that I wanted. In fact, let's let's think about that. Being born again. Before you were born, did you exist? No, of course not. Right. You didn't have any existence. We don't believe in reincarnation. You had no existence. Okay? You had no existence. Now, what is death? Death is to cease to exist. Death is, means no existence. So if you are born again, what has to take place before that? Turn with me to John chapter four, tw- 12. John chapter 12. And this is where we really, I believe, get into the heart Because how is it that we do not take part in the second death? How do we avoid the second death? How do we take part in the first resurrection? Through death. And this is the role of death in salvation. Because we enter into life through death. Jesus says in John chapter 12 verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So he says what happens to happen first? It has to it has to die. Now what does he mean by this? What does Jesus mean? He that loveth his life shall what? 
And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it. Shall keep it. Okay, now let's let's plug that into the context. He that loveth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. So there's two lives, isn't there? There's this, this first life, and then we experience a death, the first death. But then all will be resurrected. And he says, if you love your life in this world, that's the first life, the life that we're living right now. If you love your life, this first life, you will not see the second life. You will experience the second death. But he says, if you hate this life, he that hateth this life in this world shall keep it. Shall keep it. So how do we live eternal, eternally? We got to die in this life. <laughs> we got to die in this life. In this life. Now is this the way was was Christ dead in this world? John chapter 6 and what is that what does that even mean? What does it mean to die and hate this life? Are we supposed to go around like hating ourselves? Oh, I'm so dumb. I can't do any, you know, not that kind of thing, right? Hate your life in this world. What does that mean? John chapter 6, verse 38. And as we close here. And ye have not his... No, I'm sorry. John 6, yeah. That's not there. 638. I came down. Yeah, I was... I was <laughs> Looking at the wrong, wrong one there, wrong page. John six thirty eight. For I came down from heaven, not to do what? Mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So what does it mean to hate your life in this world? It means not to do your own will. I want to live life my way. And isn't that what they, uh, what they, they the, the, the song that they play at funerals nowadays? I did it my way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people, I did it my way. I lived life my way. I did my thing. But what does Christ call us to do? Deny self. He calls us to do what He did. I came not to do my own will. My own will. But whose will? The Father's. The Father's. Last year we had a chance to travel around and I met Linford for the first time. And we were there for a couple of weeks and one Sabbath I took my two daughters, my wife... The two daughters are seven and five, Hannah and Haley. And you know, we try to take opportunities to teach them and, and to train them and teach them everything that we can. And one Sabbath morning, we went out to a graveyard. And we walked around and we found a, a, a gravestone. And I don't remember the, the name of the man. But we took our kids there and, and we stood around this man's grave site. His gravestone. He had the same birthday as Haley, my youngest daughter. And as we looked at this, uh, this stone, this headstone, I told the girls, why don't you say the meanest thing that you can to this person? I said his name. Go ahead and say mean things. Say whatever you want. Say the meanest thing that you can think of. And they didn't, you know, they're young, they're cute. They didn't think of anything, you know, you, you stupid, you know. <laughs> that was the worst thing that they could think of, you know. And, and, but I said, say it again. Say it again. Now spit on his grave. 
And we sat there. And we stood there. And I asked him, why didn't, why didn't he react? When you said those mean words, when you spit on him, why didn't he react? Because he's dead. Jesus said, accept it and die. And he says, talked about it this morning, we need to what? die. And if we're as dead as that man in the grave, if we've been put in the grave, our own will is in the grave, can anything offend us? If you're dead and somebody says a, a word, a mean word to you, or talks bad about you, or spits on you, or hurts you, see when you're dead, nobody can hurt you. Nobody can offend you. Isn't that right? We need to be dead. We need to be dead, as dead as that man is in the grave. That's how dead we need to be. But you know, is that how we understand death? <laughs> is that how the majority of Christianity understands death? What's the common understanding of death? Part of you is dead, but part of you is still alive. Isn't that how most of us are dead to self and are dead to this world and are dead to sin and are dead to everything that this world has to offer? Isn't that the kind of the death that we live out in our lives? In the Christian world, aren't most people partially dead and partially alive? Isn't that how most people want to do Christianity? Yes or no? Is that how you do Christianity? Are you dead? Do you cease to exist? Or are you still partly alive and only partly dead? I pray that each one of you will die. <laughs> as dead as that man, how, how different would it be amongst us? Amongst our people, in our churches, our groups, if we were dead, as dead as that man in the grave. That's my desire. What about you? Amen. What about you? Yes? Yes, yes? Do you believe it? Yes. Do you accept it? Yes. Are you asking for it? Because unless that happens, truly happens, we cannot be born again. We have to cease to exist before we can be resurrected to a new life. Let us pray.